Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Biodiversity Information Standards uh, 2020 conference. This is uh, session SIM02, Use and Reuse of Images and their Metadata in Biodiversity Research. I am the moderator of this session, Patricia Martin Cabrera, uh, together with uh, Peter Hubrek, um, uh, and we are greeting uh, from Belgium. We're greeting you all from Belgium. Uh, we are, uh, I'm very happy to have Peter helping me today here. Uh, he's coming from the Maze Botanical Garden in, in Belgium. Uh, this session will be recorded for later viewing and it will be posted on the TEDWAC YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this session and uh, thank you also to all the speakers. Uh, in the chat, uh, the chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. So please use uh, this uh, judiciously as uh, any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result on in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Uh, please uh, see now in the chat uh, our code of conduct uh, document for more information. So during this session, you may ask uh, questions uh, you can use the chat, but actually we prefer that you post your pictures uh, for each different session in a shared document that we are going to share with you as well now in the chat, the, the tiny URL link. Um, so please uh, uh, don't, don't feel shy to add there any comments or sessions related uh, or comments related to the sessions. Um, please keep your mic microphones mute. Uh, we will all have a discussion time at the end of the session. And uh, during that time, you will be able to speak if you wish. And in that case, first, please raise your hand from the participant list menu. You can click in more and there raise hand or type hand in the chat. So yeah, we, I think we're ready to start with our first speaker, uh, who's, who is uh, Pierre Bonnet from the University of Montpellier in France. And he will talk, talk uh, us about planet services, uh, a contribution to the monitoring and sharing of information on the world flora. So please, you can share your screen now. Is this okay to you? Yes. It's fine. Okay. Can I start, Patricia? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to uh, allow us to present uh, the advent of our work. So uh, I'm Pierre Bonnet, botanist uh, working in south of France. So I'm one of the two coordinators of the PlantNet uh, initiative. And with my colleague, Alexis Joly, we are uh, leading this platform since uh, uh, 10 years. So um, we will now present you the progress that we did in the development of a new computational services dedicated to accelerate the monitoring and sharing of information on the world floor. Okay. So as you know, plant identification is crucial step for sharing and accessing knowledge aggregated over the past centuries and in the most recent time. So nevertheless, plant identification is difficult due to the high number of plant species in a given location, due to the growing exchange of plant specimen between different regions of the world, and due to the growing shortage of uh, taxonomists and in many different research institutes in the world. So this partially explains why uh, plant blindness is recognized as a major limitation in the involvement of the society in biodiversity conservation studies. Ah. In the aim to increase the capacity of citizens to contribute to a scientific project, we established 10 years ago a citizen observatory uh, named PlantNet that was based on the use of machine learning to help people to identify plants. So this observatory was initially experiment in, south, in the southern French flora and uh, gradually extend to a larger geographical 
and taxonomical context. Sorry. Uh, thanks to the improvement of the image-based plant identification techniques that we experiment, the number of registered participants has increased and uh, it has been possible to also threaten the recognition capacity of the platform. Since 2015, the plant identification service that we provide through the platform is based on the use of deep learning technology. This service allows a potential user to submit an image that you want to identify, and uh, the service returns the most probable plant species list according to the submitted image. The deep learning model used allows to propose a species name and is regularly trained on a collaborative visual data set containing few millions of images and illustrating around 30,000 plant species. Uh, the platform was initially based on a web app, extended on EOS in 2013, uh, one year later on the Android platform. In 2018, we conducted the first ecological study based on PlantNet data and uh, recently a study analyzing the use of the platform by natural reserve manager was also published in an ecological solution and evidence journal. Up to now, we count 20 million of downloads of the mobile app, uh, which allow an access to the platform. Two million of people have created a user account. In the current period, we count between uh, 150 and uh, 300 daily users with uh, and the community of this uh, platform as the translator uh, platform and the app in 24 different languages. The platform has contributed to aggregate uh, 260 uh, plant identification requests on around uh, 30,000 plant species around the world. In the context of a new European project entitled Cost for Cloud, PlantNet develops several computational services dedicated to facilitate the integration of automated identification services in other citizen science portals, such as the Natusfera in Spain, iSpot in uh, UK and or Art Portalen in Sweden. We also contribute to more largely used um, PlantNet data and tools out of the PlantNet platform in order to increase interest and, capa and capacities of scientists to implement citizen science projects. This is uh, why a version of these services will be deployed on the European uh, Open Science Cloud, uh, YORSC. So here is a list of the services that will be deployed in the context of Cost for Cloud project. The four last ones are under the supervision of the INRIA, who is the coordinator of the PlantNet Consortium and who is the official French partners in Cost for Cloud. So the first services is dedicated to provide an access to PlantNet data. Several developments have been done to reach the same, and up to now, a large, the largest access to PlantNet data is feasible through the JBIF platform uh, across two complementary different data sets. So uh, PlantNet uh, has been accepted as a, an official contributor to the JBIF platform in February uh, uh, 2020, and has contributed to JBIF with around 6.6 .6 million plant occurrences. The first uh, data set that uh, was uh, published and shared is entitled Plant Observation. It is a subset of the nine uh, million of public illustrated observation shared across the PlantNet platform. So the filtering uh, apply to reduce this volume of uh, public observation up to uh, 620,000 uh, plant occurrences on the JBIF platform, involve the sharing of observation only illustrated with images in Creative Commons and with a unique, unix, sorry, timestamp and the geolocation. The species uh, identification has to be uh, valid due to the collaborative process implemented on the PlantNet platform. Species name uh, based on the collaborative uh, uh, validation must belong to one of the checklists that we manage on the platform among the 30 different ones. And the observation of the species share must be in one of the level three of the polygon of the world geographical schema for recording 
plant distribution, which was developed by the, by the Tadwick community. And uh, this observation of that species must match the corresponding Q checklist in the plant of the world online databases. The second data set uh, entitled Automatically Identify Occurrence is a subset of the 260 million of non-public identification requests sent by the user of the platform. So in that case, the filtering phase involves the species identification is based on uh, uh, the top first soft mask, soft max output of the first species name proposed by the PlantNet identification models. And this value have to be superior to 0 0.9. I will illustrate it that, that on, on the next slide. And again, the observation has to be matched between the geographical schema uh, related to the World Geographical Schema for Recording Plant Distribution and the checklist of Q for the different uh, uh, mask of that, uh, of that schema. So in order to illustrate it, the mechanism to, uh, um, uh, which allowed us to define as a valid the observation, we illustrated here two complementary uh, observation. On the left side, the submitted illustration has to be recognized by the plantant identification models as a, an Oenantera drumondi with a score of 0 0.955. This is why this occurrence, which has a score of uh, confidence on the identification higher than 0 0.9, uh, will be shared on the JBIF platform. On the right side, here are these images, which has been correctly identified as an Aron Pictum with a score of 0 0.82, which is lower than 0 0.9, will not be shared on the JBIF platform. So the second services is dedicated to provide an access to the plant net species identification services. And this is in order to allow developers to implement that services in their own platform. And the uh, uh, first version of that one has, be, has been used in the study of Tom August, which has been published in the pattern journal and which was dedicated to evaluate the potential of Flickr data automatically identified by the PlantNet search engine. The third service is dedicated to provide the potential species list to be observed in a given area. So this computational services is based on the large scale training of a deep learning model, which have been trained on visual representation on environmental variables at the scale of the French territory. Uh, we have a prototype and uh, this development is a uh, I have a problem with my presentation. Uh, it's not the right time to have such problem. What happened? Sorry for that. Okay. I will try to do my best to finish on the right. Okay, and this uh, prototype uh, is developed in the context of the life clay challenge and the, with close exchange uh, with the Caltech in the geo life clay task. And the last uh, services that we would like to introduce is uh, dedicated to create a training data sets, visual training data sets on a particular group of living organisms on demand. And the main objective is to facilitate the creation of such data sets, which has been recognized as a main limitation to extend the use of deep learning in many different tasks in which this technology could be useful. And this work is uh, actually experiments on uh, the most impactful plant invasive species at the world scale in close collaboration and discussion with uh, teams for Cornell. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for the delay. Okay, thank you very much, Pierre. It's, uh, there was not, not a, a delay anyway. Okay, so there is a few questions and for everyone that arrived later and did not have the chance to see the chat. Uh, you can see in the chat, there is a, a, a link to a Google Doc where we will like to you to fill uh, your name. And also for each session, there is a dedicated uh, space to add questions. 
Um, so I'll read you the questions, Pierre. Um, there is the first one. Uh, are you familiar with the candid candidate develop mobile app, which also uses machine learning for identifications? And there is a, a link to the app if you can see the, the document. With which one? What is the name of the app? I did not catch. Uh, maybe if you have, uh, you can maybe stop sharing your screen and yeah. then uh, maybe you can check in the Google yeah. Doc yeah. The, the app itself. I'm not, I'm not familiar. So it, I think it's called Candidate Develop Mobile App. Okay, not yet, but uh, I will. Uh, so okay. uh, as, as you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a growing community at present time. And so there is different strategies. Some, some people only focus on ornamental plants, some other one only on a uh, um, wild one. And uh, so in our case, we really focus to try to record uh, plant species in their natural uh, environments. Nevertheless, a lot of users use it in their garden, during their trail in botanical garden, but also outside. And so we try to respond to the usage of this different community of users in the end. Okay, next question. Is there any copyright issues for the images used in machine learning, CNN, both for general use and use by commercial entities? So in the context of PlantNet, so we only share and so user of the platform share their images in Creative Commons CC by ESA. So we try to encourage the use of Creative Commons license. But when I, I think that when people train a model, they are not in the obligation to use only images with a Creative Commons uh, uh, license. And they can, and a famous uh, visual data set, which is named uh, uh, ImageNet, was used to train uh, uh, really and to benchmark different uh, convolutional neural, neural network. And so this data set and the images in that data set were not all, always in CC by ESA. So I, in, in my level of perception, I don't think that there is a, a need to use a, a, a open license data to train a model. Can you still hear me? Patricia? We can, but Patricia is not moving on my screen. Yeah, on mine too. So what I propose is that I will respond to the question directly in the, world, in the online document. Like this, I will take the time that I have and not uh, 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 reduce the time of the other present people who will present here. So thank you very much to, to to all of you for your interest. I think that Patricia will come back soon. Yes, I'm sorry I'm here. I lost the connection. Um, so yeah, maybe we can go for the next speaker, but there is actually a lot of questions if you would like to address them on the Google Doc. Yeah. Otherwise, we can also have some discussions at the end of the session. Yeah. Thank you very thank much, Pierre. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. OK. So our next speaker is Roger Hayam. Uh, he comes from the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh in the UK. And he will talk us uh, about the Triple F framework, uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework. Uh, Roger, please, uh, you can share your screen. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, if I'm sharing the right one. <laughs> Uh, yep, here we go. Hi, thanks, Pierre. That was really good. Um, yeah, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> I think I was one of the ones that in back in about 2015 said plant that would never work. So um, <laughs> can everyone hear me OK? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, probably a slightly different kind of image uh, because I'm specifically talking about images of uh, preserved specimens. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, an apology uh, because I'm going to talk about plants. And I know there are lots of uh, 
I've been to Tadwig a few times and there's usually lots of very frustrated uh, zoologists, entomologists uh, and other people around. Um, so please bear with me that I'm talking about plants yet again. And I'll, there are a couple of points which I'll, uh, I'll raise that are particularly relevant to animals. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in passing. Uh, because I'm talking about herbarium specimens, we're very lucky and herbarium specimens are mainly just flat documents, uh, which is very, makes life very easy. How do I get to my next slide? Yes. Um, so, um, if we look at the way uh, over the last 10 years or so, 15 years, we've been handling uh, images and um, across the internet and through the different biodiversity net information networks, it's tended to work along uh, this model where, uh, if I can get my pointer working, a uh, host institution, uh, herbarium or a, uh, someone else who's digitizing their specimens makes a great big file um, of a uh, great high resolution image of a specimen. They then usually uh, downsize that uh, to some degree and uh, upload it to one or more aggregators. Uh, we can think of uh, GBIF do it, um, Encyclopedia of Life, the various Atlas projects, um, I dig bio. Um, we're all familiar with a large number of, of places who are uh, indexing uh, metadata. Uh, it started their work by in indexing metadata about uh, specimens and collections and then extended it to um, also showing pictures of the specimens in those collections. Uh, people then do science based on, on those images that have, have been shared. And uh, if we're lucky, uh, the information that um, those images have been mentioned or the research that's been based on those images uh, gets back to the host institution via a citation link of some kind. Uh, and also, if we're lucky, the aggregators feedback usage information as to who's using those images. But otherwise, there's quite a kind of level of separation between host institution and the publication, uh, publications and the science being done, um, which can be very frustrating for curators because in the old days, they used to meet all the scientists uh, who used to come to their institution or they used to post the specimens to them. Um, this is what I think of as uh, we're, we're treating images like files. So images are really being treated just the same as a string value in a metadata document. If I can work out how to progress this to the next slide, I'll get my pointer back. Uh, so we have all these uh, all these aggregators out there, as well as many of the institutions having their own portal uh, to display images, which can, some will provide zoomable versions of those images, and some will um, just provide downloads, or some will provide downloads and zoomable versions. Um, there's there's a really a lot of stuff. So the trouble with this, uh, this model that we, we've all been working on um, for the last few years is that, for starters, there's a resolution I issue. Um, most of the pixels that are being captured are being thrown away unless you view the image actually at the original um, institution. Um, ultimately, you can't view, zoom into a paper. So if the image is even reproduced somewhere, it's usually reproduced at a lower resolution, even in a PDF. Uh, there's no real versioning. So the image is treated as an object in its own, uh, its own right. Um, and it, it becomes split. There's no source, single source of authority. You can get the same image from multiple providers. Probably most importantly is the notion of uh, compositing that um, if we've got a herbarium specimen or a, uh, an animal specimen, and I've, uh, I've, I've put a note there to remind me to talk about animals, um, 
herbarium specimens do pretty well with a single image usually. Um, it's nice to have multiple images if you've got capsules or if you've got different shapes of uh, carpological things. Um, but when it comes to animals and uh, specimens, you need to have multiple images of one specimen. So uh, top view, side view, back view, maybe a dissection views. Um, and that isn't e easily supported. We would have to make up our own libraries and things like that to start, try and describe how, how we, the fact that an image is a different view of the same thing rather than just one image per specimen. And also they're rarely, you don't see, you only see annotations on images that have been physically stuck on those images, um, which isn't particularly uh, helpful. So we have to question whether as we're sharing these images, even though we share them openly and we give them open licenses and we say, do what you like with us and you know, with this and, and give me a credit, whether we're really doing open science because we're not feeding the objects themselves aren't growing. Uh, they don't increase uh, their value the more that people use them, like they did in the old days when people uh, stuck determination slips on them. Uh, so a nicer way of doing it uh, might be to have a bit more of a conversation between the host institution and the consumer. Um, so that the host institution could say, I have images of these specimens, or I have images of this specimen that you might want to see, and annotations of those images. And the user could then request a version of that image, and the host institution could provide, you know, a version of that image. Most of the time, it might well be a thumbnail or a, a whole view, but it might be a close-up. Um, or just the label or, or some other rendering of it. Uh, um, it could be an X-ray or in a, in, uh, some other using some other kind of sensor. Under this model, you could also um, have suggested annotations going back to the host institution and uh, who could accept or reject annotations to the, to the original. Uh, and in this way, we could treat images much more uh, like data. This would be a, a much nicer model for handling uh, these big collections that we're digitizing. Uh, so 20 years ago, uh, when I first came to Tadwick, we would probably be starting work on our uh, image sharing uh, standard and working out how we had to describe the different types of images and how they were related. Um, but I just looked on Wikipedia and um, Apparently the wheel has already been invented. So uh, we don't need to, to make another wheel. Um, and in our case, the wheel that has been invented is uh, IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, now this has been around for a few years now, nearly 10 years, um, and is in version three and is widely used in the humanities um, community. So uh, those people who are much cooler than us at university, um, who were doing the arts and all that kind of thing, um, they've been doing this stuff for a while where they get together and use a standard way of uh, sharing images of physical objects. Um, it's also big in the uh, uh, manuscripts community, uh, historical manuscripts and things. It was a technology that was started uh, by the British Library, National Library of Wales and some institutions in the United States and is now very widely used. Just briefly um, describe what IIIF is. I get used to saying IIIF if it's new to you. Um, what it actually is, is a set of four APIs. Um, and to understand those, you really only need to understand two of them. Uh, the first is the image API, and the image API is all about pixels. It's about being able to ask for uh, an image in a certain size um, or a sub image or a certain version of an image. So it's very similar to what we do now when we actually share JPEG 
files backwards and forwards, but in a standardized way. And then importantly, we have the presentation API, which enables us to join images together. So a basic model of having one uh, manifest document describing the images associated with a specimen, which would come out through a presentation API, would then describe how you can call an image API to get images for those. Because it's quite a mature technology, there are other APIs involved, including um, a search API for searching within an object. So if the object is a book or a manuscript of some type, you can search within it and authentication to say who can see which versions and things like that, which is really getting into the woods of the thing. So I've been working for the last year or so trying to promote the use of IIIF in the natural history community and promote the natural history community to uh, the IIIF community. Um, I'm a bit, little bit behind where I wanted to be what with COVID and everything happening. Uh, but one of the key things I'm doing is putting together a, a technology demonstrator. And you can go and play with this now um, at herbariamundi.org. It's shown on your screen. I've also done a poster uh, associated with this, which has got links to the, the site. So if you have an ORCID ID uh, or an ORCID ID, uh, go along and log in and, and have a poke around and see the kind of things that uh, you can do with or start to do with IIIF. I'd also encourage you to go to the IIIF uh, website and uh, they've got some brilliant demos uh, looking at non-biological data. I'm aware of my time. Um, I was looking for someone to, I was going to put this in quotes. Um, because I said it, uh, uh, but we really need, and I think we've been letting biologists down quite a lot that um, we think that just by showing them an image of a specimen, that's enough, um, but it really isn't good enough. You need to be able to interact with a specimen and you need to be able to interact with um, specimens from multiple collections all at the same time in the same application rather than going to 15 different um, portals uh, and having 20 tabs open on your browser uh, in order to do your work. You should be, these things should, should all integrate and they will be able to integrate them uh, if we all adopt the, the same standards. So we need to treat images as data and IIIF is the way to do this. Um, Please come and talk to me later about it if you don't ask me questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for your presentation. Um, I will uh, proceed with the questions. We have uh, seven, eight minutes for to address them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're good on time. Um, so actually, this is a question for you, but also for, for Pierre as well, if you're still there. Uh, do we know if the CNN work takes advantage of the times when multiple images from the same specimen, close-ups, are present? Do the presence of these extra images improve artificial intelligence, identification, outlier detection, finding damage? So if any one of you want to address <laughs> this question. In my case, if we speak about herbarium specimen, but for field data also, I think the larger volume of visual training data is the best when we want to try a, a model. Uh, nevertheless, we have to avoid some bias related to the fact that if you have some of the species that are illustrated by a too large number of visual data, these species will probably much more present in the results of the deep learning model when you request for new images. So you have to balance the, the training data set in, a, in order to avoid some bias. Uh, and so it's it, it a question of objective in the end. And I think uh, even if herbarium data are much more rich for the 
less well-known species because they are the, the, the collection in which species are initially described. We also have to pay attention about the balance and, and the volume of data that we use, I think. Yeah. I, I could say two things, as a, kind of, if I've kind of understood the question. One of them is what's quite interesting, especially with herbarium data, is we work on the principle of having one image per specimen and always have one very high resolution image per specimen. And that's just because of the way things are digitized and the way we would thought we would share them 10 years ago. Um, it, it, most systems set up don't really want you to take lots of different images and, and make a mosaic of, of the thing, even though that would be really useful. I mean, if someone is working with a microscope on a specimen, they should be able to add images to the digital representation of that specimen that are much higher resolution. And then we should use, uh, you know, good image learning and stuff like that in order to com composite that even further. So, so we've got a long way to go in terms of from looking at herbarium specimens and, and how we treat them. And it was interesting listening to Pierre talk about, um, you know, curating a, a image set for, um, for training. And it sounds a lot like a herbar uh, herbarium curator, you know, not wanting to yeah. take, um, yeah, yeah does, do, doesn't want to take voucher specimens. So that one of the issues that uh, is interesting to address is if you're, if you're vouchering uh, in order to, for, just for identification purposes, what you have to throw those vouchers away because the herbarium won't want them because they, they're the common things and they don't want lots, they're overrepresented. In which case you can image them. And so if we actually get our imaging thing together for specimens, we will run into the same problem in that you'll look for something common in a digital herbarium and you'll find too many because you'll, you'll also have all these things that someone has been, you know, that they've been in, a, uh, in the tropics collecting the same thing over and over again from sample plots and they need to collect it to identify it. And they photographed it, added it. Um, so it's a similar kind of issue. Yeah. It would be really nice to, I mean, to join up the herbarium specimens and the uh, computer recognition. Yes, um, yes. So th th there is a, a task which is named a plant clay that was run this year, dedicated to evaluate the use of, of uh, herbarium specimen for plant species identification coming from the field. So if anybody yeah. is interested on in that subject, I will be happy to, to discuss that, Roger. Later. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we have to. Mm. I want a button you can press that says suggest. <laughs> okay, that's a very, very interesting uh, answer, collaborative answer to the question. Mm -hmm. There is actually a lot. You, We won't have time now to cover all of them. I'll just go for uh, one more because we have a few minutes left until the next speaker but we need to keep it a bit short. And then if we have time, we can discuss after or please address the questions in the document. Uh, so does the data need to flow directly to the host in institute? Can it flow through an aggregator like GBIF instead? Uh, I kind of knew this question. <laughs> Patricia said when we, uh, that we should think of one question that we would ask ourselves just in case nobody asked the question. <laughs> and this is it. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think it, it, my, the actual version of my question is, is this, you know, so many uh, uh, institutions are running into trouble with not being able to host their own data and they will run into that. So um, there needs to be some kind of level of, of you know, who handles that interaction? Um, so, uh, ultimately, the, if you are a, an institution and you're responsible for the physical specimens, you okay. really need to take responsibility for the digital version of those specimens as well. But that doesn't mean to say that you need a room full of servers to look after them. They could be provided by some cloud service or by something that you, you buy into. Just as a herbarium curator doesn't uh, go and fix his own roof normally, um, you, you could pay someone else to, to do that. And I think there's a role for 
uh, community hosting of digital data from institutions. But the, we need to have a conversation about the governance of that and the fact that the original herbaria or the original collections need to maintain their kind of ownership of those data and the governance over that data, rather than saying, oh, it's all handled by them now. Uh, because if it's all handled by GBIF or EOL or Atlas of Living, wherever it is, or I dig bio or something, then immediately what you've done is you've broken that link with the physical specimens and um, resources that go to the digital ones won't help the, the, the physical ones and stuff that goes to the physical ones won't help the digital ones. Um, and I think so, so I think, but, but then we're not talking technology so much. The technology can be handled. It's, it's, it's government governance issues that are a thing. Okay. Thank you long for your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we are going to now move to the next speaker. Uh, and also we are changing a little bit uh, the topic. We're still in images, obviously, but we're moving from herbarium specimens or uh, in situ uh, specimens uh, to a more broad context. Uh, we have Corina Gris from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, USA. She will talk us about uh, change in pictures and creating best practices in archiving ecological imagery for reuse. So yeah, you can start, uh, Corina. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me in here into this herbarium specimen <laughs> imaging <laughs> system. Yes, we are talking very different images now. And this is um, usually whole big collections of images that go together, which we call data sets. So it's a little different uh, approach. Um, and we go by this sort of definition, which actually comes off the, the Oboe um, uh, observation. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, so what we do here is that usually these images are measurements of some quality or an entity or entities. So what we usually do is turn these images into measures of biomass, biodiversity, individual counts, behavior, all sorts of different measures. And clearly this is quickly improving right now with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. These images are repeated at regular intervals or and or uh, cover fairly large spatial ranges. And then the measurements are represented as as in all images by color, luminosity, shape, and context. So I'll go quickly through some uses in ecology and then the considerations for archiving, what metadata we have been uh, discussing that might make sense, and then conclusions and discussions. And there I'm very, would be very happy for a lot of input here because what this whole project is about is a best practice description for these images in this particular context of ecological research to make them more useful for other purposes. So here's the first example where um, images of a rookery was used to uh, identify feeding behavior. The next one is about vegetation change, you can see 2014, 2018, and the changes between treatment and control. The next one is a collection from an underwater image flow cytobot, which has run on a transect. This one here is underwater coral reef imagery, again, from over many, many years, the same sort of quadrats that have been analyzed for their biodiversity. And this one here is a drone image, which tries in a prairie strip to identify uh, nutrient networks for pollinators. So these images are all a little different than what we've seen so far. And this one is probably the most different one. 
from Antarctica, McMurdo, uh, the snow cover, and um, again, many images over a longer period of time. So if we want to archive these now, there are obviously several considerations that we need to take into account. The first one is what repository they can go into because there are, for many of these, there are not any obvious places where these images should go. So first of all, looking for a, a repository that implements the FAIR principles. Uh, then what kind of metadata standards are required or supported is very important. Are they sufficient to really describe those images for later reuse? Frequently we run into size limitations. We have already heard about this because the images can be fairly large. And then um, there are a few that are very specialized, a few repositories that are very specialized and that usually only take certain images. Then there are repositories that are a little more general for a certain subject area, which is what I'm representing here, the environmental data initiative. So those are all environmental data. And then there are the general use uh, repositories like Fixshare or uh, any of those. So what do we need to archive? That uh, comes down to the workflow. And generally we have raw images, which are big. Then there usually is some processing code or at least processing step to end up with the derived data. So this would be the data of biodiversity or growth change or cover change or any of this behavior. And so then these data are being used in the analyses for the publications. So until recently, the uh, custom was to archive these derived data, describe the methods, how to arrive at it, and then the raw images were sitting somewhere else. Now that the um, interest is rising in reusing these raw images, of course, we need to archive them as well. So when we go there, why would we publish these raw images? As I said, they are big and clunky and lots of them, but we now can probably reprocess them with better algorithms. And we can use them to link up data. And that is very important in our applications because many of these image data sets have been taken in the connection of many other environmental measurements that are being taken at the same place and time. So this becomes a body of knowledge that is very important to link together. And many people go back and retake photos that have been taken many, many years ago at the same place, at the same location, and then analyze the change that way. So how do we make them useful? There obviously probably are compressed archives and the grouping of these images is important to consider what is usable, how big an archive file is still manageable or how many images should be in one, in one of those archive files. All of these are important um, considerations. And then of course the archival frequency maybe every year, maybe every month. If something takes minute images every minute, then this may be different. So how do we communicate these metadata? As I said, we in, in the Environmental Data Initiative and the LTR network, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, consider these to be a package. A package comes with a metadata file and then all the images in there, maybe the the code for processing and maybe the derived data as well, but they may also be separate packages. So clearly in that metadata file, which is encoded in the ecological metadata language, there are general information about the what, when, where, who, and how, which is then common for all of the images in one data package. Usually that breaks down, as everybody knows, into title, abstract methods, geographic, temporal, taxonomic coverage, the creators, associated people, and all of this. 
There may be camera settings, but now we're getting into the area where we may need to archive metadata for each image rather than for the whole package. I mentioned already documenting the whole workflow, as I described earlier, it, with archiving the code and the derived data as well, and then documenting how all this goes together. So as I said, we may get into the area of having to uh, document each image with metadata. And for that one, we recommend to also put an inventory table into this data package. So now you have another sort of data entity that holds metadata for each image. And then it would be file name or URL or any kind of other unique ID, which may be an accession number in a different repository. So for voucher specimens, this may very well be the accession number and a natural history collection. Then there may be timestamps, location, creator, and specific camera settings that may be in there. And if we do have them, it it's probably a good idea to extract the XF metadata from each of these images. And this way, with this inventory table, we now can associate these images and their data with other environmental data that have been collected at the same time, like weather conditions, anything else that may be going on around it. So in addition, we have now agreed that it's probably also a good idea to include into this data package other metadata, even if they come in a proprietary binary format like machine log files. So drones, for instance, as they are taking images, they also collect a flight log. There may be field notes that are associated with these images that can all go into the same data package. If there is a processing code file in there, there is another metadata standard out there for this particular purpose, and that is called code meta. The whole file can be included into this data package, can and should. So, with all of this that we have sort of accumulated here into the best practices document, we're having this goal of making the images, the raw images that have not been archived extensively so far, as useful and manageable for reanalysis as possible. So for that, it's important what repository they are going into, then how they are archived within that repository. So manage for size versus numbers of images. Then there are decisions involved in what goes into the overall metadata, which then turn into the um, discoverability, the searchability, all of this that metadata provide versus this inventory file, which will provide more information about each individual image. However, all these files that may be going into one data package are going in there with the goal to link up to other information that may be either in other repositories or maybe in the same repository because it was collected at the same time. So all of this is an attempt to make these linkages at least transparent for now until there are other ways of making this machine readable and machine accessible and machine linkable. Along the same vein is the provenance documentation, especially when the raw images are in a different data package than the uh, derived data products. So in all of this is coming out of the ecological community and it would be amazing if we can get some input from other communities on how to document these data best so that they will actually link up to what else is out there? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I hope there is some discussion 
uh, about it uh, at the end uh, of this session because uh, in the project we are also working we have uh, we would like to get the same input so there is uh, yeah about five minutes to answer some questions um, you can see also later in the chat if you have the time to answer them all um, so the first one, how can we ensure long-term archiving? Uh, where uh, or how to host large image sets for 10 to 15 years? Is there something you have been uh, uh, exploring potential repositories? Uh, have you, for instance, look at the BioImage Archive uh, project? No, we have not because right now we are hosting those images at the Environmental Data Initiative. So, okay. uh, however, if for the research purpose and the researcher decides that these images are going into a different repository, then these recommendations go for how do we link up to the IDs in this other repository. So there's obviously PhenoCam, lots of our sites run a PhenoCam, they have their own repository. But otherwise okay. it's, I mean, we're, we're talking hundreds of images in one batch, which are not very different from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is someone uh, also in the, in the chat uh, mentioning uh, for Zenodo that could be also uh, interesting as a open access repository. Yeah, the problem with Zenodo is that the metadata are so minimal that there is not much in for the findability of these data. So they're, they're probably sort of disappearing in this huge big mess of the, what Zenodo is. Yes, it's, it's fairly simple to get your data in there and it's fairly simple to just throw them up and store them. They do have a size limit there at Zenodo before. So after above a certain size, you have to talk to them. And I think they take only up to a certain size. But the metadata, um, it just will not enable any kind of discovery in. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was wondering that the problem, when you talk about the problem with size, is it because of you? you will you would like to include raw images i wonder if it would be only the processed image that would be as well a problem it would be yeah if you have hundreds of them yes okay yes you you get into the if you hundreds of fairly high resolution even medium resolution it's the size is very quickly a problem mm. i mean the size for just running it across the internet. <laughs> it's not so much us, it's really downloading. Sorry, Roger. Oh, yeah, I was going to say a, a thing, I, a slide I cut out from my talk was an example of using Zenodo to, for herbarium images, um, where I think the size limit is per item you upload. So you can do, that way you can, yeah, one item per herbarium image, you get a DOI for it. Uh, but we run into the uh, metadata issue then, um, right. and I'm looking at ways that we could do that for for plot voucher specimens would be classic that you can upload those and then rely on a third party service that will then present them nicely. So Zenodo looks after the longevity and the storage, but you need something else because you can you can put your metadata document in with the data, but then you need some. Right third party to to make it findable right. um, and I think that is actually probably always going to be the model because how it is findable and how it interacts with other things is context dependent um, whereas this kind of storage isn't um, so you might find that you something like Zenodo where you it stores it but then you have different other views onto that yes with a I unique think that ID. Is Right, I think that's that's the general idea that a lot of this is going for. I mean, storage will forever be something that we all have to pay for one way or another, and yeah. that will have to be resolved one way or another. <laughs> and then, yeah. So, but but this is exactly why we recommend to put other metadata files into the package as well, 
yeah. uh, is even if they are currently like binary and proprietary, there may be an application in a year or two that will use those files and will make these data much more usable than we can right now. Okay, so I go for another question. Um, so when do you when you said raw images, uh, did you mean raw image format or just unedited images? Just unedited images, yes. Okay. But I mean, when you start talking drone images, you talk multispectral, you start talking all sorts of other information that is in those images. So that's I don't know. I don't know where you draw the yeah. line between raw and <laughs> unedited. Yeah, I, I feel the same, especially when you were showing the images from the Flow Cito bot. This is there is since you take the first picture until the, the last process pictures, there is a lot of steps and you can depending yeah, what it means. I, I'm not sure if there was uh, who commented this if it want to add something, but there is yeah, a big comment after this question. So maybe you can uh, go through the, the rest of the questions and try to address them, Corina. Okay, thank I'll you. Try. Thank you. Perfect. So I'll go now for the next presenter. And so this is Katrina Exter from the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium. And she will talk us about the genomic observatory use case and the challenge to standardize image and sequence data to the Darwin Core format. So please, uh, Katrina, okay. you can share your screen now. So I'm sharing my screen and clicking present. And is that everything okay? Yes. Okay, okay. so um, I'm going to be presenting today one of our genomics observatory use cases for uh, squishing data into Darwin Core Archive or some other appropriate format. Um, so I will start off by uh, explaining what a genomics observatory is. And this is a quote I found uh, online. It's uh, an ecosystem and or site that is subject to long-term scientific research, including but not limited to the sustained study of genomic biodiversity from single cell microbes to multicellular organisms. So that means that genomics observatories, they regularly collect material that is then sequenced uh, to get the DNA, uh, and that produces information about the genetic diversity of the, of the site or the sites. Um, genomics observatories also usually collect uh, um, biotic parameters or abi abiotic parameters, uh, photographs, and uh, visual or field observations. And the entirety of this data is used to provide insight and effects uh, of climate change on biodiversity and ecosystems. So genomics observatories provide a clear case for data standardization. Um, so all the data that arises from each unique sampling event need to be linked together. All of the data that arise from each sampling event need to be linked to all the data from all the other sampling events in a genomics observatory because there's usually multiple stations running within a genomics observatory. Um, spread over time and also spread over space. Um, and um, all the data should be interoperable with each other um, and ideally also interoperable with uh, data from other genomics observatory projects uh, and data from monitoring stations and, and so on that you could also use. So this means standard format, standard vocabularies. The parameter space has to be well defined. So the genomics observatory used, uh, the, the particular one that I'm talking about is called ARMS MBON. ARMS stands for the Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures, which are this, this is, um, where's that Ujima e Flick pointer? Uh, this um, picture here is about uh, 25 centimeters uh, by 25 centimeters in size. Um, and MBON stands for Marine Biodiversity Network for the Genetic Monitoring of Hard Bottom Communities. So that's uh, the bottom of the seafloor. And there's some links here. Uh, ARMS MBOM is being run under the Assemble Plus project, which is partnered with EMBRC, and it's also part of the Global ARMS program, which was started by Smithsonian. So these ARMS units um, here are their, their settlement plates, their stacks of settlement plates that sort of mimic the complex structure of the sea bottom. So they're emplaced uh, for a few months at a time, colonized by marine species, 
And then the units are retrieved, so they're pulled up, and the colonists are studied. In our arms network, we have about 20 observatories distributed along the European coastline and some Arctic stations. And we've been doing a yearly sampling since 2018. And um, this data is going to be used to study indigenous and invasive benthic species populations. Now, we have multiple data streams that come from any one sample. So when I say sample, I'm talking about one of these units placed at one, in one harbor for one period of a few months. So that is one, some, one sort of one uh, master sample, if you like. But this master sample produces multiple data streams because from this sample, we get, uh, we spit out the, 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 the creatures that have colonized it into sort of different fractions. Um, so we have the, the colonists themselves, the things that settle on these plates here. Um, but when you bring the arms unit up, you sort of package it in a box. And so there's a lot of water uh, around. And we also treat that as a, as a, a material sample. Uh, so we take photos of the colonists um, and any interesting uh, material <laughs> creatures that are in the water that, that came up with the unit. There's also field observations, visual observations of, 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 um, that are made by the scientists. Um, and then the, the material, so the colonists, once they've been blended <laughs> and uh, the water, uh, sent off to be sequenced. And so these sequences um, is also another data stream. And so these, uh, these individual data streams all produce at the end of the day, species, information about species, and uh, a measure of account. So from the photos, we get species and counts, and visual observations, we get species and counts, and from the sequences, we get species and uh, a sort of a measure of, 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 of a quantity. It's not really directly a count, but it's some kind of relative measure of, of a quantity. And the idea with ARMS is to combine this information with um, any um, biotic or abiotic parameters that are being um, collected by nearby monitoring stations. A lot of these units are in harbors and along the coasts, and, and there, there's quite, in some places, there's quite a lot of monitoring stations nearby. Um, so to describe this uh, pictorially, um, this is my sketch of an arms unit. And so the first, first thing that happens is when someone brings it up, when the, when the plates are brought, the, sorry, the units are brought up, that someone looks at them and says, oh, that's interesting, and then writes down, uh, CSV file, a spreadsheet, with, which is basically a species list, species that they found and the number of species that they found. Um, we also have um, part of the protocols is to take images. Uh, when, once the units are brought up, they're disassembled. And so each plate is photographed, the top and the bottom of the plate. And these photographs are then inspected either visually to produce a species list, um, or they're inspected with software to produce a processed image or subsetted images. Um, and then from these, you get a species list, so a species and some kind of account or, a, or an area on, on, the, on the image. The next thing we have are what I'm jokingly called the escapees. So these are the, uh, the creatures that came up in the water that was um, brought up, or creatures, uh, plants as well. Um, and these things are also inspected visually to get a species list. Um, but there's also photographs taken of, of any of the interesting ones. And then these are also analyzed with software to produce uh, intermediate images, processed images, uh, which then use to produce species lists. And then finally, and this is in fact, the main focus of this genomics, genomics observatory is the genetic side. So the plates are scraped, blended, filtered, packed up in falcon tubes, and then they're sent off to be uh, sequenced. The water, uh, so, so these, these are the, um, what we call the sessile fractions, so the non-moving creatures. Um, and then anything, the, the water that, that comes up with the arms unit is also, is also filtered and packed off in uh, falcon tubes and sent off to sequence. And this gives us the motile fraction. The sequences, they, they, you first get raw sequences out. Uh, they're called, uh, they, they come in a format called FASTQ files. These are then processed with software to clean them up, to subset them. Um, they're compared to libraries of, of sequences. So we know that species have these particular codes, uh, the subsets of the codes. And so libraries give you lists of um, species 
that you have found from your from your um, your raw from your process sequences. So you get a species a list with some kind of relative measure of quantity, but you also get a whole bunch of um, uh, quality control files um, uh, that obviously need to be need to need to come along with the results because without the quality control files, you don't know what the quality is of, of your results. So um, so that means that. Um, all the data, so this is all the data we want to be able to store in a data format in a way that allows all the links and the dependencies to be made between all the data from all the samples from all the stations in the ARMS Genomic Observatory. And we want these data to be interoperable, ideally interoperable with other biodiversity, genomics, biology, <laughs> and ecology data. Um, so, uh, what is the what are the parameters that we need to hold okay and, and what is the immediate source data that these parameters come from so first of all we have um species and counts it's always like i said species and counts that we get from the individual plates by visual analysis so the source data here are field observations of the plates it's more an action than an actual data set um then species and counts from the individual plate images um which uh, are found by, by looking at the images. Uh, and so the source data there are the raw images. And in this case, I simply mean the JPEG files that came out from, from, the, uh, from the camera. The, um, the image, the, the photographing process of these arms plates is not particularly so sophisticated. Uh, it is, it's got a very well-defined protocol, but it's not particularly sophisticated. Um, then we have um, species and, and counts uh, that come from the individual plate images that are found by image analysis. So the source data here are the processed images produced by the code, but those are created from the raw images, the, the original images. The next thing we have are the uh, escapees, so the, uh, the, the sessile fractions, uh, sorry, motile fractions. Um, and so you also have visual observations where the source here are the field observations that were made during the retrieval of the arms unit. Then you have images which are either inspected visually or images which are inspected by software. And again, you, the immediate source data are the processed images which are created from raw images. And then finally, we have the, uh, the species, the, um, the, the um, genetic part, the sequence analysis. So the source data here are the clean, are the the clean sequences matched to sequence libraries. And that's, what, and that's the immediate data that you, you have that gives you a list of species. But these clean sequences um, come from raw sequences, which are extracted from the sessile and motile fractions, which came from the arms unit. And you've also got the libraries, which are created by um, um, generations of scientists studying uh, sequences and identifying the species that they belong to and different libraries of courses will give you different uh, different results. So all of these species and counts need to be linked to the, the immediate data that they were derived from, but also, um, as was said before, to the original data, the raw data that they were derived from, because if you want to repeat the experiment, you have to start from the raw data. Um, so um, we have, you can sort of say species and counts are derived from, let's say, traditional inspection of the individual parts of the arms unit. So each of the arms unit, the plates of the arms unit are inspected by photographs or by, by eyeballs. Um, and then we have the sequence analysis, which gives us uh, spe species in a measure of quantity, which is derived from the entire unit. So the entire unit is scraped and blended and, and, and sequenced. Um, now, the thing is that we can get, it is possible that the same species it can be detected by the traditional and by the sequence method, okay? Um, it's, it's essentially, it's all the, the species all come from the same arms unit. So it's possible that if you're looking at photos or you're looking at eyeballs or you're looking at sequences, you can detect the same species. So it's important that we need to be, identi to be able to identify for a species, which particular immediate source data that species identification came from. And we also need to be able to link the species detection 
to the immediate data it came from and link that also to the raw data it came from. So whatever data format holds these, these data needs to be able to make those links. Um, so and particularly for the images and uh, the previous talk was very interesting. It did make me think a lot about perhaps we should ought to be storing our images in an image server rather than just on a standard archive, which is what we're doing in the moment. Um, for the images, when they're, they're stored in, in, in um, the Darwin Core archive files, we need to um, make sure that we don't double count. If the same plate is inspected by someone's eyeballs and someone taking a photo and analyzing the photo, we need to make sure that we don't double count. Um, so um, we need to be able to link the species, as I said, to the immediate data source, so the raw, the processed image, and the original data source. Um, uh, now, we have dozens of images. For each arms unit, there, there are some people, for some reason, take hundreds of images. God alone knows why. Um, there's only uh, nine plates. Um, but there's lots of images. The images um, have unique IDs. Um, at the moment, we're archiving them just as, as, one, as a zip file. So one zip file per sampling event per station. Um, but what we would like is that the individual images in the zip files can be referenced um, and linked to as the data source, not just the zip file as a whole, but the individual file in that zip. Um, and also that the location on the images where the, the creature was found, where the species was found, can be included either as data or as, as metadata. Um, and as I just said earlier, the previous talk did make me think about whether we should be looking at storing these images on an image server rather than in a, just a, a file server, which is what we're doing at the moment. The focus of genomics observatories is in the name, it's the genomics. But one thing that's unique about the ARMS uh, genomics observatory is that we we, we, we're collecting data that will allow us to compare the traditional methods of analysis to the genetic methods of analysis. They're not, they are sometimes gonna find the same species, but they're not always gonna find the same species. And it would be interesting to see how the different methods compare in the efficacy um, of, of, of detecting um, the species. So that is indeed it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina, um, for your talk, very interesting. Um, so here are a few questions. We have, we're very, doing very good with time, so we have some five minutes to answer mm -hmm. questions. Um, so, uh, what are the challenges you encountered in your data mapping efforts to Darwin Core? Um, and now there is a list of uh, more questions related to this one. So, for instance, uh, containing or referencing the images and the, sequ the sequences, holding mm -hmm. the provenance metadata, ensure implicit assumptions around Darwin core standard, what can be mm -hmm. seen as an event, avoid possible double counts of the species, how to declare mm -hmm. that in Darwin core? Yes, indeed, <laughs> these, are, these are the problems. So at first it was figuring out the best way to, to for each um, sampling event, an arms unit goes down, comes up. Then we take photographs of it. We make visual inspections of it. The photographs are analyzed in, in different ways. And then we also, we take the whole lot and we sequence it. So what was going to be an event, an event, an event, and a sub-event, and then eventually an occurrence. So this was the thing we were trying to map out. Um, and then when we thought we'd got a handle on that, we realized that you can have one species detected in three different ways. And uh, when the, you have the, um, the extent, the, the IMOFs, the measurements of facts attached to that species, you won't know where they come from, which, which data path does it come from. And if, um, if anybody's interested, I do have, we have been making flow charts. Um, I'm, uh, the links, I assume these slides are gonna be provided, but if not, I'll just put the links in the document. We have a flow chart of the data streams um, and we've also a flowchart of our first thinking about how to store all these data and metadata in a, a dark Darwin Core Archive um, event uh, format. 
Okay, yeah, perfect. I'll put the links in the question. Yeah, finish. please, uh, you can add it here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is some more writing in the same question. Maybe you can have uh, a look at it and uh, and see yeah. if, if there is something else to address about mm -hmm. this. But uh, yeah, indeed, we we had uh, we're having also encountering some same difficult difficulties when trying to map to to Darwin core. Mm -hmm. um, so another question, or more, more is more a comment. Uh, as the sample size is very small, uh, I think the chances of missing the animals are very high. That's um, more about the methodology of the research, but uh, if you want to comment anything on this. Uh, does, that, does that mean the sample size is like the physical size of the arms unit, I guess? Um, and uh, yeah, well, um, I uh, ugh, don't know how to stop this, this um, Google thingy blobber. Um, yeah. So the, the species do tend to, even though it's a, they're quite small units, uh, they tend to sit on top of each other. Um, mm -hmm. So you can miss something because it's stuck underneath um, and you'll only find it when you sequence. And of course, when you do the sequencing, you'll also find the stuff that's too small to be seen by the eye. Um, so, and this is one of the things that, 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 that this complementarity between the traditional methods and the genomic methods, we want to see are they complementary? Do they find similar things? Or do they find totally opposite, or not opposite, different species? And therefore, do you need to do both? Um, that's one of the things we want to get from these data. But it's true, we're not talking about big areas. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. OK, perfect. Thank you. And uh, last one, uh, did you encounter any problems finding the control vocabularies or Darwin core uh, terms uh, when you're mapping to, to Darwin core? Um, uh, so far, we've, we've mapped most of them. Um, so we don't have um, anything particularly difficult. Um, I mean, it's mostly um, by a geographic, temporal, um, and um, just which particular protocol has been used. Actually, one difficult, well, not one difficulty, but one thing we haven't found yet is um, if we're going to link to images, then um, you need to provide a URL, and if you, if you write, there is a, a, a space in Darwin Core for providing a URL, but indeed, if you want to provide some information about the images, metadata about the images, so this is an image of plate five bottom, there isn't as yet, or at least we haven't, haven't looked, to be honest, <laughs> for the okay. vocabulary that can say which location on the plate um, is it, um, or if you want to say that this is uh, an image of, I don't know what, <sighs> something okay. or the other that can help you search for that image in an archive. Um, so we found most of them, but there are some more um, ones that are unique to the arms units and the physical units that we haven't yet managed. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you very much. And then if you wanna please add your links to the document and also see if there is anything else that can be uh, added in, in your, the questions for you. Um, yeah. okay. So this takes me to the last uh, presentation, which is actually myself. And that's the reason why uh, I volunteer to organize this session, because actually I, I'm also working with the uh, images and I thought it would be a, a good opportunity to build up this, this session. And that's the reason why I'm doing both. So I will share my screen. I am Patricia Cabrera. Um, I work in uh, Flanders Marine Institute uh, in Belgium. So this, uh, I will present you here, uh, the work uh, we are carrying out uh, in the framework of Jericho S3 project, which is a project, a uh, joint uh, European research infrastructure for uh, coastal observatories. And uh, here with uh, uh, all the names you can see in the screen and the affiliations underneath, is the people working in the data management uh, work package of this project. And specifically what we are doing is to um, uh, recommend be best practices for marine plankton imagery data and metadata. Uh, so this is the outline of the presentation. 
I will briefly uh, just uh, explain why are we studying plankton, uh, the different approaches to measure plankton and specifically the different plankton imagery sensors and the, the, the roadmap that uh, we are following uh, uh, for this project. So plankton is the foundation and vital component of most uh, marine trophic webs and it's key in most biogeochemical fluxes. And in fact, uh, it contributes 50% uh, of the global earth photosynthesis. And I will uh, just say that sometimes uh, plants and trees uh, take all the credit, but we need to remind this. And especially today when I think we have a lot of uh, botanists in the room. Um, also, uh, zooplankton help us to understand the dynamics of food availability for commercial fish species. And in addition, uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton abundance and diversity have been tagged by the Global Ocean Observing System as essential ocean variables and essential climate vari variables. There are also uh, many different approaches to measure plankton. Uh, we have taxonomic counts using traditional microscopy, genomic tools, uh, bio-optics, flow cytometry, satellite images, and quantitative imagery. And all of these approaches together, uh, they are very powerful, but uh, the problem is that uh, sometimes they uh, lack uh, cross calibration. And this is the reason why uh, quantitative imagery uh, can provide us uh, a, a very good, um, uh, we can get a very good measure uh, for uh, all plankton types and to determine uh, biomass, abundances and sizes of uh, plankton organisms. And now uh, here in this slide, you see a lot of uh, sensors. Uh, they are all collecting images uh, of plankton, either uh, in situ in, in the sea or as uh, bench tops in the lab. And the main difference here is the size, uh, the size range uh, that they are targeting. So as this uh, wide variety of instruments, there is also a wide variety of metadata derived from these sensors. And uh, uh, the, the, the problem we found is that currently there is not a standard practice to add or link image metadata to plankton biodiversity data. So this is the work plan that uh, we, the, the different steps that we have built to achieve our goal and that I will uh, go uh, deeply in the next uh, slides uh, for each one. First, uh, we wanted to identify what would be the, the most ideal uh, standardized uh, format to ingest uh, this, this data, image data, uh, which uh, we, uh, we identified Darwin Core uh, obvious and schema as the best one. Uh, then uh, the second step was to identify what vocabularies and terms are existing and missing related to biological imagery data. <coughs> then we also looked at the uh, different platforms that uh, we can long-term archive the images. Uh, then now we are currently also uh, working on implementing data flows from sensor to the, the infrastructure, the European infrastructure where the data will be in, ingested. And finally, uh, which will be by March uh, 2021, uh, we will um, uh, write our guidelines and recommendations uh, on how to standardize and, line, and link images and the data, metadata into the, the Darwin Core obis M schema. Uh, so here I, I will present you briefly uh, in how in which consist this schema. Uh, this is uh, this has been already in use by uh, widely in use by Emonet Biology, Obis and Eurobis and Jebif, and it is uh, the the standard for publishing biodiversity data the, uh, based on on Darwin Core but with uh, some modifications. So this one uh, consists on uh, an event called uh, table. 
uh, which uh, will enable the linkage, the linkage of, in, of quantitative and qualitative uh, properties to both the sampling events and also species occurrences. So all these three tables uh, will be linked to each other by event ID and occurrence ID. Uh, so here, this, uh, we also include uh, other fields uh, for property standardization, such as the BODC vocabularies, uh, also the World Register of Marine Species, uh, which, uh, which provides a quality control on the taxonomic species uh, names and also marine regions, uh, which is the database that provides a standardized uh, marine place names and areas. Uh, so this, this format can be found here in this link in the OBIS uh, website. And it's been, or it, it was published by the Porter and colleagues in 2017. We, we want to follow this, but we need to do some uh, modifications to our uh, the, for the images, and that's why uh, um, I include here the, this uh, Darwin Core term, which is for the, it comes from the multimedia uh, Darwin Core extension. And I'll show you how it looks like. Oh, well. So this is the, the template format that you can find and that we will uh, follow for the event core. Uh, here we have the different field names, but also if they are mandatory, recommended, or mandatory if they exist, according to, to OBIS. And for the event core, we, want, uh, we, we will follow the same. Then for the occurrence table, uh, here what we would uh, have to, what we would recommend is that, uh, for instance, uh, for the field basis of record, in our case, uh, we found uh, after looking at many data sets that uh, for the same type of data, uh, here it would be used uh, uh, different options. But for image data taken from image sensors, we would recommend to use always machine observation. And there are some other terms uh, related to the uh, media uh, like associated media, here we will add the link to the image that will take you to the, rep the repository where the, the, the images in a zip file would be stored. And uh, other uh, parameters that normally were not uh, mandatory uh, according to this format, but for us, we would like to make it mandatory. Uh, so it can give you more information related to the identification as sometimes this data is being, uh, it can be validated or not uh, by, by a human. Uh, and then we have the third table, which is the extended measurements or facts, and where uh, there will be also a lot of information that will, uh, will help to uh, understand uh, where these samples, uh, how these samples were processed and coming from. So here we have done also, uh, we have mapped all these values from, uh, from the Darwin core term list, but also from the BODC vocabularies, as I have uh, showed earlier, uh, to see what was missing and what not, and, and what we need to create. And this is still uh, our, our work in, pro in progress. I wanted to just quickly show. Now, going back to the next slide. Uh, the second step uh, was to, to identify these, these terms and vocabularies and how we do this was retrieving uh, all the metadata found in Ecotaxa. Ecotaxa is a, is a web-based uh, web uh, open tool that uh, you can use for annotate images uh, for taxonomy, uh, also for, and, but also for uh, storing them. Uh, and here we retrieve uh, all the metadata from 11 instruments, the instruments I show you in the, in the first slide. And uh, also with uh, the people involved in, in the Jericho project, we completed, completed this list uh, to see how, how we can map these terms to the existing vocabularies, which is the second step. 
and uh, we use we look uh, mainly at uh, Darwin core, but also at Audubon core since it has more uh, it is uh, more uh, specific for images, and there are some potential uh, terms that we we may use also from here related to the image image itself at pixel resolutions and and so on. And then uh, finally, for this task, the third uh, step is to create the, the vocabularies that uh, are not existing yet. And for this, we are using uh, the uh, GitHub uh, repositories dedicated for, uh, for these standards. And some of them have been already created. Some others require more time, like for instance, now we have here a list of uh, the all the instruments in uh, imagery sensors and we are just uh, collecting all the information that is needed to create the BODC vocabulary on this. Uh, then for the third step uh, and something we have already talked in, in other presentations today, we look at different image repositories uh, to, to see where we can archive these, these images either raw images or just the image that it will be linked to every uh, occurrence in the Darwin core table. And we look at, uh, there, we found that there is some specific uh, plankton images repositories like Ecotaxa, although this is more uh, a tool uh, than, than a repository itself. Uh, there is also the, uh, Imagine Flow Citobot uh, dashboard, which is more specific for this instrument, the Flow Citobot, uh, from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and that is actually connected with uh, the CBAS um, uh, data, database from, from NASA. Uh, we have also looked at the uh, other uh, image repositories that are not plankton specific. But uh, we found, for instance, the BioImage Archive, which it has uh, great potential, uh, although it just uh, started. Uh, it is in, in the first year now, and it is uh, something we are, we are going to really look into it uh, to see if it would be possible. And actually, I was uh, hoping that uh, today as well, we can get some, some input from the people uh, uh, today here in this room to, to, to give us some ideas of other potential long-term archives. We have looked uh, as well to Zenodo and we've got some very good information today about Zenodo, Fixture, and so on. Then uh, for the last step, last step, which is the data flows. Um, so here, this is an example of the data flow we would like to, uh, to follow. Uh, so imagine we start from our, this is a cytosense uh, sensor and uh, that is uh, capturing images. So this uh, and data as well. So all this data and metadata with the raw images can be uh, flowing uh, straight to Ecotaxa where the images can be processed, annotated, annotated and or validated. And uh, in, in the framework of this project, but also other projects, as you can see here on the uh, bottom uh, uh, left corner, such as the Belmont Forum project and the www.pic.net uh, site, and as well for, for Blue Cloud, we're working on uh, formatting the structure of the, the data set that enters in Ecotaxa. That, and that gets formatted to the Darwin uh, Obis M uh, format with our modifications for imagery. And this uh, will have also a, a, an API that with one, one, one just click, it can flow to European uh, platforms uh, like Aerobis and Emotnet Biology, which are the ones that we have collected and here is where the image repository will be, uh, the images, the link will be in the, in the Darwin core and it will be linked to a repository, which we don't, didn't find out yet. And finally, this will be uh, shared with, with the community. So 
this is uh, this is my pre presentation, and I would just like to to call out anyone working with uh, plankton or imagery, imagery sensors and interested in getting involved on this work because we are still uh, we still have a lot of time to do this, and we would like to to get the input of the community to to build up the vocabularies, the workflows, and yeah, all your input is really really recommended. So that's all. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess now I answer questions to myself. I ask my questions to myself. Can we help you to okay. do that? Uh, hello? I just was the, the, saying uh, if we can help you to do that because you, you, you if you do everything it will ah, be probably not easy. For uh, you. Yeah, if you want to ask me questions, that that would be um, more logical. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I I will start by the. the I just can't question. hear you very well. If you can talk uh, a bit louder, please. So it is mentioned. It is. It is asked if you did encounter any problems finding controlled vocabularies or Darwin Corn term list needed in your project. Um, is this a question for me? Because I think ah, no, I, it was it was it was in the previous. So yes, as a, as the last question was uh, okay. not yet finished. Sorry, okay. sorry, but no, no worries. Um, sorry, Patricia. So actually, for I don't think there is any. I don't see any question. Am I sharing the Darwin Core image data Google Sheet anywhere? Uh, yes, I can. I can share it uh, here. Although I will need to see if uh, all the information there is correct. This is a work I have. We have done together with this project, and uh, if I check and make sure there are no mistakes, I, I can share it here with with you. There is already the same the same uh, spreadsheet uh, with obvious uh, recommendations that you can find in the link that is in the Google Doc, and I just uh, grabbed this document and I was uh, adjusting and adding all the information I could find uh, for this project. So I, I can ask a I can unmute myself and ask a question because I'm. Yes, please. <laughs> um, in the, the old-fashioned way of asking questions. Um, so, who, when you're in your workflow, there, who's going to look after the data? The the, you know, if if we were normally doing things like an inst in an institute was you know in the old days, thirty years ago, someone would do a study, and the data would go into the library and the library would look after it in perpetuity because that's what their job was. So you're saying you, you haven't got an image repository to put the images in. Um, have you got someone to look after the rest of the data who will then- Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, why so don't when they take the- Yes, uh, so the data uh, is going to flow to uh, Emonet Biology and Eurobis, which uh, maybe I didn't explain, but these are uh, European platforms to, to archive freely data and that is uh, easily findable and accessible by, by anyone. So, so the data so is there, it will be there and it will be take care. Yeah, so why don't they want the images? Uh, well, uh, I think we have here the, the answer from uh, the problem we had in the previous uh, presentations as well the size, yeah. the size and how it, uh, it, the way it works now, the, the standard practice on how they're archiving the data, it, it, it does not uh, include a folder, an external folder that has images. Yeah, so, because in the old days, I'm just thinking of, of you know, the government, government side of it, you know, in the old days, the, you turn up and if you had too many boxes to put into the library or into the archive in the institution, 
the librarian or the archivist would just say, no, I'm not taking that. And mm -hmm. it would be discarded. Yeah. Because so, curation is about choosing what to keep. Exactly. And this and, is and why- And so who, who is doing the choosing what to keep at this point? It's kind of being forced down. Mm -hmm. And we, exactly. we just can't yeah. keep, we never in history did anyone ever keep everything. Mm -hmm. And yet and, our conversation and, seems to be around doing that now. And this is actually why I was asking Corina earlier about uh, if her, her, the problem about size was only uh, for raw images, but also for the, for the processed images, because there is a big difference, especially uh, with the sensors I am, I am dealing with. They really uh, have uh, the, the a volume of uh, image data of the images from the raw, raw images as if they come out of the sensor to the last step after processing and identifying, it is really a big difference. So I believe I saw from her talk how it is important to keep these raw images, but I also see that if we need to compromise about volume uh, size uh, to keep it or not, that maybe it is not that important to keep the raw images. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a compromise. Someone has so to one make one consideration one consideration for this is that uh, maybe they don't need to be in a managed online accessible place. So that Indeed. makes for for a lot more options. Please but I think that. there's a hand up, and I shouldn't say anything. Okay, thank you, Karina. Yeah, that's true. That. Uh, to keep a uh, link to the data and accessible by anyone, the minimum amount, and to uh, actually archive in a different way, not in a, in a cloud, the, the big amount. But again, it's like Roger said, at, at the end, it can be discarded as well when no one is interested in keeping this. Okay, um, I'm checking more questions. I think there's a hand up. You want to, Patricia? Oh. Okay, thanks. Another Patricia, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yes, Patricia Merchen. Uh, yeah, as you are based in Belgium at Vlis, you should contact yes. Mimo, who is was formerly called Via. I put the link in the chat and in the document because mm -hmm. uh, the millions of raw images from the Meso Botanical Garden are stored there. Okay, and they yeah. charge uh, 100 to 150 euro per terabyte per year. And they also have a service okay. that if your image format is changing, uh, that they prevent it, that it's becoming obsolete and they guarantee portability, but it's called storage. Huh? It's not, a, so you still need to have the, the smaller size JPEG also in a dynamic place if you want to access and work with them, but for archiving of your raw images, they have a quite good service. And we are discussing in the framework of the infrastructure disco and LifeWatch with your colleagues at least to, to use this kind of services in the mm -hmm. framework of the okay. implementation of the European Open Science Cloud. So talk to your colleagues and to this company and okay. they already okay, store a lot for uh, cultural heritage also, and they are used to it. So this could be a, a solution for long-term preservation. Oh. Okay, that's uh, that's good. I, I think we had a look at it uh, at the beginning of the project. Uh, so I guess the downsize is about about the payment. As but um, yeah, we'll we'll see. Okay, maybe there is time for one more question. Uh, so I will add the link for the GitHub uh, for creating the vocabularies. I'm using uh, BODC and also um, uh, for Darwin Core, and I can I can put the links the links there. Uh, it is quite straightforward. I have done already the creation of some parameters, and it was uh, quite quick. Actually, you will need to add the uh, definition and a reference of to this definition. And yeah, I think it took about two, two to three days to take uh, 
to build up a, a, voc a term, a vocabulary. Um, so how do you currently reference images in your publication? This is a, a very good question. Um, I'm not sure if any researcher here that have done any publication with images want to answer this question as I have done it, as I haven't done it. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll see if someone can answer here uh, in text. Yeah, Pierre, please. So just in our case, we highlight some uh, observation share produce from the PlantNet platforms, share on the JBIF and use the DOI of the JBIF to highlight that observation and the illustration in, in some publication. So this was uh, the way that we use and this was fully based on the system developed and deployed by the JBIF platform for that. Is, is this a standard practice or is this something you came up with so, so yes, in our case, it, it, it was not uh, widely, uh, it was not possible before. And so it uh, mainly done because we publish and push the uh, observation on the JB platform. And so all the observation which, has, which are not shared on the, on the platform cannot be uh, uh, present and reference uh, by this way. So it, it's an opportunity offer, I think I would like to say, for the contributor uh, to, the, to that platform. But uh, if your data is not uh, adapt to be shared on, on that one, it's not really easily feasible. Indeed, indeed. That's very good. Uh, okay. So Trisha. I think, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just, I couldn't find how to make my hands hands up on the thing. Can I, I just wanted to say, um, because about the, the, the sort of raw images process, image and storage, it is true that raw data, raw images, especially if they come from things like drones, they're very big. And indeed, um, providing them for immediate access online is um, probably not necessary because not only are they too big to store, but they're too big, even at the moment, to, to, to download. And they, they are crucial because this is the data upon which the science is based. And in some ways, it's unrepeatable. If you throw the images mm -hmm. away, you throw away money because you have to be able to repeat um, the scientific results. So they have to be there. They are extremely important, but they're not going to be used very often. So indeed, what, what, what you need, you do need, I think, to provide the immediate source data that a result came from. So that's the subset of the image, for example, um, or even the code that is used to create the processed image. Uh, so just that, that snippet of code. Um, with a, a reference to where the um, raw data can be taken from, that will mean that we will need to find vocabularies to describe, or they probably are already vocabularies, but we will need the metadata then to hold mm -hmm. the description of, this is a raw file, this is an unprocessed file, this is a processed file, this is the one that you should be looking at first. I mean, stuff like that. So I think this is also important metadata that needs to be added to, mm -hmm. to images when they are, um, reference, well, when they're used as, as scientific data, indeed, rather than as just as files. Indeed, indeed. Oh, okay, uh, is, is there anyone else who would like to do any comments? We only have five minutes left uh, for discussion. Uh, and now, uh, uh, you, if you want, uh, you can just uh, I, unmute yourself and, and use the, the video function. Okay, I'll check uh, the document or the chat. Uh, okay, yeah, I see a, a question. It says uh, that I mentioned populating associated media field in the ENV data record, but will you also create a multimedia file? The idea is only to to add their link to, to the image that would go outside because it's the more efficient way as we, as we want to follow the, the more accurate. It's like, a, I think Roger's presentation when he said, we're not gonna invent the wheel, 
same for us. We want we don't want to uh, invent uh, a new new standard or a new format when there is many there. We just we like to reuse everything that is there and adapt it to our needs. So if anyone, uh, no one has anything to, to add, uh, I would like to thank you all very much. Uh, to all the speakers, uh, also a special thank to, to Peter. Uh, you have done a great job helping me here with the session. And also to Ted Weck, uh, because uh, without uh, you gave us the opportunity to have this session, which uh, I'm, I'm very happy. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, we, we meet uh, in another uh, opportunities in other projects related to images. And yeah, thank you to, to all the presenters as well and to everyone that came here and contributed with your questions and comments. <laughs>